Good morning, everyone. A happy new year. It's lovely to be back with you this morning. Just want to share this scripture from Isaiah 60. It says, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. I just wanted to share that with you this morning, because that gave me hope. I'm reading this book. I got John a book for his Christmas, but I stole it. <laughs> and so he's not even had a chance to read it yet. And I'm in the middle of reading this book, and it's um, by Tommy McNeil, and it's The Sleeping Giant. It's fantastic, isn't it? I've not read it all yet, but the parts that I have been reading have been really speaking to me personally, and I just wanted to share it with you this morning to encourage you all and it's out of Ezekiel 37. You know, when sometimes there's hopelessness in our life, there's discouragement, and you know, this pandemic has brought that, um, if we're all honest, and it's talking about the dry bones, but it's calling out to the dry bones because the dry bones came together, but it was the breath of God that gave life. And I just wanted to encourage you this morning that as you enter this time of worship, to call out, to God, to call out to the breath of God, that where there is pain and hurt, that he can bring healing and wholeness. Where there is discouragement, he can bring hope and faith. And where there is despair and peace, he can bring life. And that's what this book is about. It says at the back, it's time to awake, it's time to arise, and it's time to move. It's time. God is saying, it is time. He is with us. So you want to stand as we all worship together. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword, still we are the voice in the desert crying, people. dry bones becoming as flesh and these are the days of your servant David rebuilding a temple of praise and these are the days of the harvest the fields are as wide in the world and we are your laborers in your vineyard declaring the word of the Lord behold he comes Shining like the sun, at the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's here of Jubilee, and it's 
of your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest nights you were close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness Work 
in me, first and foremost, work in others' lives. But Lord, this church, we hand it to you, and we say, Lord, have your way. Glorify your name. Jesus, be the center. Holy Spirit, be the bread and breathe life unto us. In the name of Jesus.
pleasure to have George with us this morning, George. So I'll just invite you up and thank you. All this morning, praise the Lord. Isn't it good to actually come together again and sing praises to God? It's been so, so long, too long, too long. Um, we are George and Joan Owens uh, from Scotland for Jesus. Uh, I also pastor a small church in Law Village. Uh, you know where Law Village is? It's, you know, it's, it's right smack bang in the centre of the universe. Uh, it's God's own country. Uh, and if you believe that, you believe anything. Uh, but you know, when, when God actually showed us this vision for Scotland to go to a church that was and is largely still is dead, and he, he, he actually sent us out some years now. But as he sent us out, he gave us this portion of scripture to take to the people in the churches in Scotland. I'm sure you know it all well. It's Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn away, from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. What a wonderful portion of Scripture, and one that we desperately, desperately need to bring into our churches today. Now, I was speaking to John earlier, and he was saying, George, just take all the time you need. And I said, that's dangerous, brother. So, <laughs> I hope you've brought a big piece. No, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. But we're going to be looking at the very aspect of prayer this morning. So, before we look at anything else, let's indeed come before our Heavenly Father once again in prayer. Heavenly Father God, we come humbly, Father, before your mighty throne of grace, acknowledging you, O Lord our God, as King of kings and Lord of lords. Father, you are indeed awesome. Father, you are almighty. You're the one true and living God. And Father, we love you. We love you so much, O Lord our God. And we would pray, Father, as we come together this morning, Lord our God, as we look to your word, this morning. Father, would you move among us through the power of your Holy Spirit. And we would pray indeed, O Lord our God, let us when we leave this place be in no doubt that we have been in the very presence of God Almighty himself. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now I'm sure there are lots of people here who are married, they are They've got children, their mums and dads perhaps are here, uncles, aunties, grannies, papas, neighbours, friends. But I wonder how often do we speak to our loved ones? I'm sure uh, if you're anything like us, you take every opportunity as much as you can. But while thinking about this, I remember when uh, our son and daughter were at primary school and uh, they'd be coming at home time and if you were the one in the living room when our daughter came in you were cornered you were absolutely cornered you know she would say dad well I just said and we met so and so and I, I talked and I said and she said and you went right through the whole day right communication our son on the other hand was completely different he would walk in the door and I'd say hi William and you would get a one-syllable answer. Oh. That took him all the way through his teenage years. He was still communicating. Not very well, I must admit. But he was still communicating. But I wonder, and here's the question, and I'm going to be asking a lot of questions this morning. Please take a, a mental note of them. But how often, I wonder, do we speak to God? Are we faithful? Uh, do, we, do we speak to God every single day? I hope so. And you know, there's, there's no excuse not to. 
You know, I've heard people say about Mal, you know, I don't like to, to, to pray really because ugh, I get awfully embarrassed and stuff. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. You know, I've heard people say, I can't pray. Nonsense. There's no excuses. I have seen babies trying out to God. I've witnessed it. And it's wonderful to see even them. So here's another question. Why do we find it so difficult to pray? And some people do. Why is it that the prayer meeting in almost every church is the least attended? These are questions I want to ask the Lord when I get home. Why was that the case, Lord? Why wasn't it? Excuse me just a second. Why is it, isn't it the most attended meeting of the church? Because it's the powerhouse. You know, the enemy will do everything he can to stop us from coming to the prayer meeting. How often are you ready to go, you're ready to walk out the door and the phone goes? And you hear that voice saying, don't answer it. But you go and you answer it and you think, oh, I'll need to take this. Oh, dear. I'll need to go and sort this out. Or, indeed, there's something good on the TV. You can't miss it. We need to be where it's all happening. We need to be in the powerhouse before God and bringing our prayers before him. Here's another question. Why then should we pray? Why not? Because we have a God that loves us so much and he wants to communicate with us. He wants to. He loves to hear our voices. He knows exactly what's on our hearts even before we open our mouths. He knows what we're going to say. But like any loving father, he just loves to hear his children's voice. You know, one thing, one of the, the very first things that we, we learn as a new follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, number one, numero uno, is we learn how to sing. Whether we've got a voice or not, we learn how to sing. And the second one should be the fact that we learn how to pray and how to pray correctly. God wants to hear from us. How would it be if we only spoke to our mum and dad or our parents or our siblings or whoever just once a week? They'd be saying, what's wrong? You know, if I didn't speak to Joan for two days, she would be given, what's up with you? What's up with your face? And she's right. You know, why shouldn't I want to communicate with somebody I love? And God is exactly the same with us. He says, why do you not want to communicate with me? Don't you love me anymore? And yet that's what some people do with God, isn't it? We speak to him on a Sunday and then we ignore them the rest of the week. Oh Lord, we're too busy. Lives are too full. Too much to do. If that's the case, then we need to slow down. We need to give God his time. We need to be before him. Here's another important question. When you go to prayer, do you know who you're praying to? George, that's a kind of daft question. It's not really. It's not really. You know, there are so many gods in this land today. We need to know that we are praying to the right one. We need to. I remember many, many years ago, Joan and I have been involved in, in radio work for many, many years. We went to Ecuador as missionaries to be radio programmers. And El Radio Bien Pastor, the Good Shepherd radio station in Ecuador. And as we were going through our training, I remember one particular time and I was on, on air, I was live, and we were, being, were down in, in Leeds, Radio Worldwide. Their teaching is absolutely superb. And all of the instructors are listening in to every word you say. 
And of course, in, be in between playing songs, uh, I was bringing forth the good news. I was speaking about God. So I went to music one time and one of the instructors came through and they said, George, that's good. But who is God? Who is your God? You've got to be specific. And I thought, you know, that's so true. Especially in these days. Who are we praying to? Well, make sure when you're praying, you're including the fact that you're praying to Jehovah, Yahweh, the one and only true and living God. Let's be specific. Bring it down that it's Him that we are honoring in our prayers. It's Him we are worshiping in our prayers. We've got to be specific. I want to take you to a portion of Scripture. If you've got your Bibles with you, if you could look to Acts chapter 12. I'm not going to read through it all. I'm just going to read sections of it. But this is the word of the Lord, and it says, Now about that time Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some of the church. He then killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. This whole chapter here speaks wonderfully of the power of prayer. Here we have the situation where James has been killed, and uh, we're finding another brother has lifted, he's lifted, Peter is, is taken, and he's been put in jail. And it talks there about the, the fact that, you know, that there are so many people guarding him. Uh, that actually works out somewhere in the region of about 16 men. They were making sure he wasn't going anywhere. And he's locked up in this prison cell. His intent was to kill him. But the verse 5 there, it says something very important. It says, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God, Jehovah, for him by the church. The church was in prayer. Of course they were. And it was fervent prayer. They were praying so earnestly, Lord, please save Peter. Don't let him go under the sword. He was bound and chained to two other soldiers, plus all the other guards all around. And then out of nowhere an angel appears. Wow. And he strikes him in the side. I find this absolutely fascinating. He must have been in a real deep sleep. You know, and it's a case of, Oi, Peter, Oi, waking up, boy. Oi, what is it? What is it? And he says, arise quickly. And at that, the chains fell off completely. They were gone. They were gone. He was free. And you think, wow, isn't that amazing? The angel then tells him to get dressed and follow him. But he thinks, perhaps, I'm thinking about Peter. He's just awake. Is he thinking, am I still sleeping? Is this really happening? And the angel says, come, follow me. And he gets to the big iron gates in the city, which are locked, and they open on their own. And you think, wow, what an experience Peter's having here. Wow. And then he turns around, no more angel. And he thinks, okay, what I'll do now then is I'll head to Mary's house. And in verse 12 it says, So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother, mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. 
And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice because of his, her gladness, she didn't open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. Can you imagine it? There he is. He's been set free miraculously. And he goes to where he knows people are praying for him and he knocks on the door. And Rhoda goes out to answer the door. Hears his voice. Does she open the door? No, she runs back into the house again to tell everybody, Peter's at the door. Peter's at the door. Aye. Aye, right hen. Aye. It'll be an angel or something. That's what they said to her. And she goes back out again. This time she opens the door. It is Peter. It is Peter. Verse 15 it says, But they said to her, You are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said it's an angel. Now Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the door, they saw him. And they were astonished. Why? Why? That's the question I would ask. Why are they so astonished? They were together praying. Were they expecting God not to answer? Seems like it. I wonder if that's how you are today. In your prayer life, do you go to prayer thinking, well, you know, I'll pray, but I I don't know whether God will hear it or even answer me. Please, please don't ever think that. Please. Here's another question. Do we know how to pray? Jesus, the one that we follow, has given us an outline of what and how to pray. And of course, we can find this in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13, and it says thus, In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know, the Lord has shown us the blueprint for prayer. He shared this with his disciples, of course. But he expects us to use the same example even today in our prayers. I remember a young man coming before me and asking me many years ago, he said, George, how then should I really pray? And I said, here's the best way, son. Come before Almighty God Jehovah and worship and praise to honor him to glorify him, to exhort him. Then come before him with the things that are on your heart, with your prayers and your petitions. Then worship him, praise him, honor him, glorify him, and exhort him. That's the way we should be praying. Too often, dear brothers and sisters, we come before God with a shopping list. Lord, this is what I want. It's not how it works. It's not how it works. Why should we glorify him as much? Because he and he alone is worthy. There is none like him. None like him. You know, Jesus shows in so many ways why prayer is so important. He often quotes, he said, I must be about my father's business, my father's will. How then did he and should we find out what God's will is for us? You know, that's the hard part. What is God's will 
for the storehouse. Incidentally, as we were praising the Lord there, I felt the Lord was, was saying for me to tell you, He has someone for you. He has someone. A man of God. So just be patient. Keep praying. Keep praying God's will. And it will come. But we should pray as Christ did. And he gave us plenty of examples of that. Right at the start of his ministry, remember when John baptized him in the Jordan? Luke chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus was also baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was open. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. Matthew 14, 23. And when he had set the, 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 sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Luke 6, 46. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. You know, there's a pattern here. Is there a mountain close by? <laughs> Is there somewhere you can go to to pray? Luke 6 and 12. Now it came to pass in those days that he went to the mountains to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. When was the last time we spent all night in prayer to Almighty God? I could go on. There are so many but time limits us. But what's Christ actually saying here? He's saying, go to your closet or go to a trysting place. Have you ever heard that word before? Not many people have known this word. This trysting place. What is this trysting place? It's a place where you feel close to God. I remember as a, a young Christian many, many years ago, my trysting place would be the living room my living room. And I would walk about praying, my eyes shut. You know, I'd walk into tables and, and, and knock things all over the place. And Joan would say, goodness, George, why? I'm in prayer. I thought, well, at least watch where you're going. You're breaking more vases than everything else. But you know, I wasn't caring because that was my special place. I met with God in my sitting room. Since then, there are many places where I would consider my trysting place. I love to go up to the top of our village in law. And as I stand up the top, I can see all over the village. I can see over into Lark Hall and Motherwell and Hamilton. It gives me a, a tremendous opportunity to stand there and pray over these places. It's a popular spot for walkers. And, and often I've been standing there and people have walked by and said, you all right, George? Yeah, fine. I'm just talking to God. Listen, don't ever be ashamed to tell people that you're talking to the Lord, that you're in prayer. In fact, as they go by, tell them, Look, listen, I'll pray for you. Will you really? Yeah, of course I will. It's amazing how people find it absolutely so special that you would pray for them. Why shouldn't we? Why shouldn't we? Find that special place that you feel close to God and pray to your Heavenly Father who hears you and will answer you. He will answer in His time and in His will. You know, this lovely lady, my wife Joan, prayed for me for years. She never gave up. And I will be eternally grateful to Joan for praying for me. I wasn't in a good place at all, believe me. But she prayed me through. So there's a lesson in that as well. Never give up in your prayers. Never give up. Have you been praying for somebody for so long now you're thinking, is, is God really hearing me? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He will answer you. No matter how long it takes, but it'll be in his time. And in his will, 
It might not always be the way that we are looking for God to answer our prayers. We might be praying for a specific healing or whatever. And God sees deeper into the body and he says, no, the soul's got to be healed first before the body. We just don't know. We don't know. When we go to prayer then, what do we pray? We need to find time in our prayers to pray for the unsaved. Brothers and sisters, there are people today that are on the road to hell. Oh, George, we can't talk about hell. Yes, we can. Yes, we can, and we need to be talking more about it because people are going to a lost eternity. And we are God's voice, whether we like it or not. We are God's voice. You guys are God's voice in this area here of Kilsyth. You're here for a purpose. I remember, again, when I was saved, and a, a lovely old lady, Nan, discipled me. And she taught me for oh, months. Every time we met, she would say, George, sit down. How are you doing? I'm fine. What have you got to say? Nan, I'm saved to serve. Great. She never let me forget that. We're saved to serve. We're not saved just to sit in church. We're saved to go out there and do what God's asking us to do. So we need to pray for the unsaved. We need to pray for those who hate us. Oh, George, wait a minute. That's, that's oh, stretching things a bit. Yeah, I'm sorry. We have to. The people who show absolute desire, a desire of a hatred in their hearts, for, we've got to pray for them. God actually asks us to do that. Pray for your enemies. Pray for them. Pray for your family, your loved ones. Pray for your neighbours, your friends, your schoolmates, your workmates. Pray, pray, pray. Here's another question. Would you like to see this church filled to overflowing? Can I see hands? Yeah, brilliant. Well, you guys need to do the work. You do. And the work starts in the prayer room. On your knees, if possible. I'm at the age now, it's not getting down, it's getting back up again that's a problem. But I'm sure there'll be brothers and sisters that could dare to help. But honestly, guys, I'm serious about this. If we are serious about the things of God, we've got to do the things that matter, and prayer is so important. James 5 and 16, it says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman avails much. Guys, get a banner and put that up somewhere, please, because it is so meaningful. It is so meaningful. God is telling us today we have the answers to all the questions if we take it to the Lord in prayer. Philippians 4 and 6, Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. Jehovah, Yahweh. James 5 14 and 15, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. Do you believe that? I don't hear much in the way of yes. Do you believe that? I'm going to share a story with you. Joan and I have lived in Law Village for oh, 47, nearly 48 years. We, we moved from, Law, uh, from View Park when we married and moved up to Law. We have done so much in the way of out, out, outreach work and stuff in the past. It's been tremendous. But five years ago, God spoke to us in prayer and he said, start a church. And we said, Lord, we're all over Scotland with Scotland for Jesus. And you want us to start a church? When are we going to sleep? 
But you know, in his goodness, grace, love and mercy, this church has been ongoing now for five years. The first year and a half we met in a council building and we prayed in our home on a Tuesday night, it was a prayer meeting, and we prayed for a year and a half solid, Lord, there are so many people in law who are hurting. Could you make Law Christian Fellowship a first aid post for these people? A year and a half in, as I say, we got word of the doctor's surgery in the village, a small building. It was closing. I'm not going to tell you the whole story because it would take up too much time. But we got that place. And we're sitting in it one time and having prayer. And one of our, our leaders, uh, an elder, Mark, and a young lad, and he started to laugh. And I said, Mark, what are you laughing? He says, George, God is some sense of humor. I says, how? He says, we've been praying for a year and a half, Lord. Could you make Law Christian Fellowship a first aid post? He's giving us a doctor's surgery. <laughs> Amazing. Absolutely amazing. We're not a big church by any manner of means. But you know what? We love the Lord. And you know, we're getting work done within the church to, to convert it so we could use it as a sanctuary and a Sunday school room. And uh, one of the problems we had was with the uh, plumbing. And my son, he's a joiner, but hasn't a clue about plumbing. And uh, so we, we, he we made inquiries and and a, a workmate said, listen, he said, my son is a plumber. He said, but he had a bad accident about a year ago. <clears throat> and he said, he can't work anymore. He says, his, his right arm is really bad. Can't use it. He said, but he might come out and advise you. Maybe even talk you through how to do the job. Brilliant. So the guy came out and I met him in the car park. And of course, the first thing you do is go to shake his hand. And of course, this hand's just lying there. And he gives me his other hand. And I said, how are you doing? He says, no so good. I said, what happened? He said, I was up a ladder, fell. He says, I didn't on my back. He says, that's not too bad just now. He says, but this arm is, that's gone. He said, my elbow is up here somewhere. He said, I'm in constant pain, 24-7. And I said, well, please come in. I said, listen, I said, I don't know whether you attend church or whatever whether you even believe in God, but can I pray with you before you go? And he said, sure. No problem, big man. That was, that was really what he said to me. So he did. He went in with my son and they, they talked through the, the job. They went and got the things they needed. They come back, completed the job with lunch. And he said, George, I'm just going ahead. I said, look, can I take you into what was the doctor's room, the consulting room? And I said, we will, we will meet with our Lord, our God himself. The great physician. Aye, whatever, big man. Okay, and I read him that portion of scripture from James. And I said, all I'm going to do is anoint you in oil, put my hands on you and pray. I don't know what's going to happen, if anything's going to happen. It's not up to me, it's up to God. And he said, okay. So I put my hands on his shoulders and I started praying. And I felt God saying to me so clearly, George, the arm that is damaged cup his arm between your hands and as you pray just bring them down slowly and I said okay I just did what God asked me to do and at the end of the prayer I said amen I said now my friend how are you feeling and he looked at me and he said how am I feeling and I thought well, he's going to hit me with his other hand his good hand he said how am I feeling I have no pain he says, I came here this morning. If you had as much as touched that arm I was on the ceiling, he says, you felt it all the way down. I didn't, but that's what he felt. And he says, I feel no pain. Praise God. Praise God. Yes, give God the glory. Yes, indeed. Because he alone is worthy of all our praise. But you know something here in the West, we forgot the power of prayer. We well, forgot that God answers prayer. God heals today every much as he did way back then. But you know something? We've lost the confidence in God. We need to get that back. We need to get that back. We really do. Some things that uh, I've noted here 
maybe some things that you would want to do as a church or as individuals or whatever. An old-fashioned thing that we've done, John and I have done for years, prayer triplets. Do you know what they are? Prayer triplets. You get three people, right? People you know. And each person has three people that they want to pray for. So that's three people with three people each. You meet at certain times and you pray through those people. The same ones all the time. So you end, you end up praying for nine people. And then, of course, you don't pray or you don't leave a prayer meeting without praying for uh, the other three. So you're praying for 12 people within a, an allotted time, whether it's quarter an hour, half an hour, whatever. And you keep doing that until the Lord breaks through. Does it work? Here's an example. Billy Graham crusade from way down in Earl's Court in London many, many years ago. And by satellite, it was being broadcast all over Great Britain. We were part of the, the Church of Scotland in law at that time. Uh, and we were doing the prayer triplets. I was with a minister, Bill Isaac. And Bill went to prayer. And I couldn't believe my ears. He was praying for the three toughest boys in the village. They were hooligans. I mean, they were rascals. What was he praying for them for? You know, I mean, but he prayed faithfully all the way right through till the meeting started. The meetings were on all week. The Wednesday night, I almost fell because the door opened. Who walked in but these three boys with their bottles of iron brews and, and Mars bars? And they sat in the seats in the pew and uh, Billy Graham was on and he was preaching. And it came to the altar call. And who got up but those three boys? Three boys. You're right, we Ian. Yeah, hallelujah. <laughs> they were converted right there in that evening. Why? Because Bill was faithful in his prayer. Prayer triplets is one. Prayer walks is another one. I don't know whether you guys practice this or not. If not, you should do. Get out there in twos and threes. Don't go in a big group. You can if you like, but I find it more effective if you're two or three. You're not drawing att attention to yourself. You could be just talking to each other. You're actually talking to the Lord as you walk around. Where do you go? Well, I'm sure like every place, there'll be places here that need prayer cover for whatever reason. I'm sure there are families that you know that are really needing prayer, but they won't come near church. Stand near to where they, you don't need to stand outside their door, but stand near to where they, they live and pray for them. Pray for God to touch them in a wonderful and a marvelous way. We as Scotland for Jesus, we, yesterday, uh, we had uh, the, the first uh, national half day of prayer. We've been having a half day of prayer for two years now for, and the first Saturday of the month it was Saturday or yesterday because New Year's Day was the first Saturday of the month and we meet within our wee church but we em implore people all over Scotland, England, Ireland, Wales all over the world people stand with us and they pray for this land and the people of Scotland people all over the world Mal Malawi, Malawi uh, people in India, people in Pakistan, America, Ecuador, Colombia, Spain, you name it. We've got people all over the place that are praying for Scotland. The land that used to be known as the land of the book. Unfortunately, not anymore. But please also know this, and I'm almost finished. Please also know this, when you go into fervent prayer, when you're really getting into this the enemy doesn't like it you need to be prepared for that he will come up against you but greater is he that is in us that is in the world amen and we need to remember these things can I also say that we've got a, a stand up the back or a table up the back there it's got information please have a look at that before you go but for Scotland, Scotland for Jesus, we do special seminars. And one of them is, is spiritual warfare. And believe you me, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today we need to know who our enemy is. 
we, know, we need to know how to defeat our enemy. And we can do that with a seminar. We have spiritual warfare. We have a marriage seminar, purity seminars. That's for young girls. Because this world will tell them they're nothing but sex uh, images or whatever. That's not true. They're daughters of Almighty God. And therefore they should be pure until they find the right man to marry. Oh, that's going right against society today, I know. But that's how God wants it. We also do a respect seminar. That's for young men, for boys, to give respect to young women. Because if they're not respecting them, they're not respecting themselves. And under God, we need to respect ourselves as well. And of course, the prayer seminars as well. We're only scratching the surface here today. But our God is good. If you're interested in any of these things, the leadership can contact us. The details are all there. I hope and I pray that we've all learned something today about prayer. Let's start this brand new year as we mean to go on. Let's get, let's get serious with God. Let's stop all the pretense. Let's get down on our knees and spend time with him. Find out what his will is for your life, as I'm doing in my life. Find out what the, what the Lord's will is for your church. We need to do these things. And the best that way to do it is in prayer. So let's come again before our Lord and our God. Almighty Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. We thank you, Father, that we serve a God who loves us so much that he's so anxious to hear our voices. He wants to know what's going on in our lives. The things that bring us joy, the, thing that brings, the things that bring us unhappiness, sorrow. He wants to know them all. And Father, can we ask indeed, Lord, for your forgiveness at the start of this brand new year. Lord, would you indeed call us more and more to prayer. Let us find that trysting place. Let's start attending the prayer meetings more and more regularly. Let's indeed, Lord, just turn everything over to you. And may you and you alone be praised, glorified and magnified. For we ask it in that name that is above every name, that one day every knee will bow to and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In his lovely name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God.
Your face. 